you know, one thing I, I, I you know, I, I have to remind people often is the rights of the teacher are greater than he or she who does not teach. And so when, as a salesperson, you are providing definitive teaching value, content, text, video, etc., that's helping them make an informed decision, you have earned the right to ask them to do things your peers cannot ask them to do. So I can say to you, Nick. Hey, Nick Ninton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, Nick Nansen here, and welcome back to Now to Next. Thanks for joining this live stream. Uh, I've been waiting for this one for a while. Um, of course, I didn't expect uh, them to be re-roofing my home on the day that we did this, but we're gonna we're gonna work through the thumps because that's that's the way life is these days. Uh, welcome to 2020. But I got a great guest for you here today. I've got Marcus Sheridan on. We're gonna talk about uh, hopefully an awful lot of stuff. I will say that. Uh, Marcus's book, The Ask You Answer, uh, shifted my perspective on marketing more than any book for sure in the last decade. And, and I'd put it up there with one of the top two, three, four things that I've heard uh, in my career that really just made me say, oh, wait a second, and did a complete shift. So Marcus, congrats on an amazing book. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I, I'm glad to have you here. Yo, it's a pleasure, Nick. We're going to have a good conversation, I'm sure. Uh, it, it shall be fun. And so, look, normally when we are not in a pandemic mode, uh, you do a ton of keynote speaking. Uh, you are named a web marketing guru by the New York Times, uh, one of Forbes' 20 speakers you don't want to miss. Um, you put out this book, and it really was based on an experience that – and now you do global consulting all across the globe through, from the book. It's based on your experience running uh, a company that most wouldn't put on the sexiest company list. Uh, you're running a, a fiberglass pool company, in-ground fiberglass pool company. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it looks like you started that business or got into that business with some friends out of necessity, uh, married, young, out of college, baby. Uh, I had my first son, by the way, a week after I took the bar exam. Uh, I got married after my first semester of law school, so I totally understand uh, what pressure feels like. Tell us about getting into that business and a little bit about the nuance of that business. Well, you know, as I say in the book, nobody ever uh, grows up saying, I want to be a pool guy when I get older. But, you know, I graduated uh, college and I was working in Northern Virginia, didn't like my job, went back to where I grew up, northern, uh, it's called the Northern Neck of Virginia with my wife. And my two buddies had just started a pool company. And they're like, hey, do you want to come work uh, with us and you can run this little store that we have and we'll install pools out in the field. And, I, and I'm like, okay. I'll do that until I figure out what I want to do with my life. And so uh, I ended up being asked to be the third partner within about six months. And that was 2001. 2008, the market crashes. Looks like we're going to lose the business. And that's when I really start to learn about the Internet. And, you know, Nick, I read a lot of stuff. And I was like, well, basically what it seems like everybody's saying is I just obsess over my customers' questions. And I'm willing to address them on our website through text, through video. Maybe we can save the business here, right? And so that's what happened. To make a long story short, we became the Wikipedia, if you will, of pools. And today we have the most traffic swimming pool website in the world. It's almost a million visitors a month. And um, it's, it's been a crazy ride. And to your point, you know, I, I started writing about all that stuff. And that's what led to me speaking and having an agency. And so today I've got an agency with about 70 employees. Um, along with the pool company still. It's been utterly unbelievable, all because of content and the willingness to obsess over customers' questions. Uh, and, and it's a brilliant thought. So it, while you say it that way, and it, it became pretty obvious to you, there's obviously was a lot of synthesizing happening because there's so many books on uh, all the different types of marketing and great offers and sales letters and irresistible offers. And like, there's like, there's a lot of things you got to do, right? Like business, business is hard. I mean, it, 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 there, if you want to grow and scale, there's just a lot of things you've got to do well. But I think a lot of people, I mean, to me, I have been to countless, look, I've worked with probably 
five or six of the top marketing gurus in the world. And no one ever just said, hey, Nick, here's all you need to do. You just need to <laughs> you just need to answer their questions. So, you know, you had this revelation, I think, when I explained. So I have uh, the reason it's sort of fun. People watching this will laugh because I've been referencing your book in probably every conversation I've had since I read it at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's just so obvious that like all we do all day long is go to Google and say, Google, what do you what do you have for me? And, yes. and even when I go into a store now that we can go a little bit back into a store, although it's so underwhelming now to go to a store, there's like not, they don't have anything I really want. I can't get any reviews, you know, like going into target now or best buy. I mean, which is almost a foregone conclusion is just not a great experience no matter what you do. But I, they are, the company is very good at telling me what this product is perfect for. But I'm so worried that like, what if I'm what if I'm the square peg? What if it's not for me? What if, you know, what if that Gatorade won't quench my thirst because <laughs> I play, you know, I run 30 seconds slower than the guy that, like, we all have these questions like this fear of, but what, um, what if it's not right for me? And I think even an even bigger fear, and this one you really address in the book too, I mean, I do a lot of work with financial advisors and probably, I've yep. probably worked with a thousand over the last 10 years. And so the funny thing about most financial advisors is they all... They all really and wholeheartedly believe in what they do, and they really wholeheartedly believe that what every other financial advisor does is crap. And so the hardest part about it is is trying to get real answers. And so my only question has become, I totally understand why you love it and you believe it, and everything you're telling me about makes complete sense. However, um, when and where will this blow up? That's my only question, because there has to be some... I mean, no one even thought of the pandemic when I started asking this question, but like, oh, they're like, oh, it's an insurance product. It will never, the U.S. has never allowed an insurance company to go bankrupt. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me though, but if the U.S. changed the laws and they could go bankrupt, then this could go, well, that's not going to happen. But I really want to know, especially when you're, you're dealing in high stakes and finances and, you know, my family's financial wellness or a retirement fund or, or my parents invest, whatever it might be, like, I've got some serious questions that I want to know where could this go wrong? And I think that's what, whether people go to the extent now, I just started like cutting to the chase, like where does this go nuclear? So you can just maybe give me some honesty. Um, and they're not intending to be dishonest, but they're so sold on their own product and who it can work for. And everyone looks like a great prospect. We've all been there that, you know, this is sort of the world we live in. And the, and as a consumer, particularly now with no end to the customizable options we could find for anything, we want to know is this person right for me? And more importantly, I think, when would this not be good? Because you've already told me that it would be good. So you realize, that was a long diatribe to get there, but hopefully it was helpful. Um, you know, you realize that people are just going to Google asking questions. And so what happens if I just start answering the questions? Now, you even talk about in the book, there's a lot of objections that people have, particularly to like price is one of the biggest questions. Like before I even engage with you, is this a $10 or a $10 million solution? Like pretty common very upfront yep. question. Most people hate answering that upfront because it doesn't allow them time to build value. It doesn't allow them time to to let people not just focus on the price. So let's talk about the hard questions, which lead to hard answers, and how you present those. And, and obviously, I know you've seen every objection under the sun. Uh, what are some of those objections? How do you overcome the objections? Like, ah, I shouldn't be publishing pricing in my business, whatever that business is. So in the book, we call it the big five. And these are the five subjects that buyers, whether in everything we're talking about today, just for the audience, Nick, is B2B or B2C. So if you're listening to this, do not put yourself in that corner of we're different because assuredly you are not. It's very based in human psychology. H to H. Joey Coleman right. said that in my interview recently. It's human to human, right? Yep. That's right. So, uh, so with, that being, with that being said, there's five fundamental subjects that we love to research and understand before we engage a company today, B2B, B2C. And that is cost, problems, comparisons, reviews, and best. And so think about all the times that you've searched any of those online. Now, cost is one of the most prolific. Yet, for some reason, cost and the rest of the big five, but cost especially, companies do not like to talk about these things on their website. And we have reasons for each one justifications that businesses make when you hold them up to clear let's say buyer test they don't they, they they have no weight so let's look at cost and price there's three major reasons why companies don't like to talk about cost and price 
Number one, they say we have a very customized solution. Every job is different. All right? That's very easy to overcome because the key when you're talking about cost and price is actually four, four things that you need to explain. If somebody wants to talk about cost and price well on your website, through video, through text, whatever it is. Number one, what drives costs up? Number two, what keeps costs down? Number three, why are some companies expensive? Number four, why are some companies so cheap? That, my friends, defines the value proposition in your, in your space. That is also the thing that's going to decommoditize the thing that you sell because if everybody understands that scale, everything else falls into place at that point in time. That is the big key. So we've got to make sure that we do that. Okay. So that's the first one is helping them understand what drives it up, what keeps it down, why some companies are expensive, why some companies are cheap, et cetera. Et cetera. That's number one. Number two reason why we don't like to talk about cost and price. We say our competitors are going to find out. That's really, really silly because if you went to your sales team, or anybody that's been in the game for any period of time, and you said to them, so do you know what your competitors charge? Or at least you have a pretty good sense of what your competitors charge. They're always going to say, yeah, I do. And so if you have a good sense of what your competitors charge, it therefore means your competitors have a great sense as to what you charge. See, this is the big secret, non-secret. Everybody acts like nobody knows what everybody's charging, when in reality, everybody has a very good sense as to what everybody else is charging. And the final reason we don't like to talk about cost and price, or at least the the reason why we justify it is because we say we tend to be more expensive and so we don't want to scare them away. But the thing that actually scares us away online is when somebody isn't willing to address the thing. We've done the studies on this, Nick. We know that when somebody's looking for cost and price information online and they cannot find it, on average, they'll stay on, on your website for 10 seconds or less. And if wow. they leave, they ain't coming back. They are not coming back. So those are the crazy justifications that we make. Uh, all and we we do that an awful lot. So um, when it comes to pricing and cost, when uh, when people don't want, they're more expensive, and they don't. I mean, obviously, I guess you could say you don't want people to know. But I think it's. I think we should probably reframe that. Obviously, to like, there's a reason why certain things are more expensive. I mean, Dan Kennedy, when I used to do a lot of work with Dan, legendary marketing guru, Dan yep. would say people will always say, "Oh, in my town, people aren't up for that," and he would just say, "So what are they interested? In? Well, they want they want lowest price." He's like, "So just answer me one question." Is there any store in town besides Walmart? They're like, yeah, of course. It's like, well, is there a parking lot? Does, is there ever anyone there? Like, yeah, yeah, there's people there. It's like, okay, another question. Does everyone in town drive a Kia at the time? They're, they're making much better cars now, but does everyone yeah. drive a Kia? Well, no, no, no. They drive. Well, does anyone drive a Mercedes? Well, yeah, they, okay. So we need to reframe this conversation because people get concerned about about being uh, about consumers being overly price sensitive, I would normally say it's because you're not giving them a reason, a justification for why you're charging more. It's very clear to me why I might pay more for a Mercedes than I might pay for a Honda. While they both do the same thing, uh, there's a different uh, there's a different air that comes to the Mercedes. It probably has better, not always, but probably has like better finishes and trim and better technology and some of those things. But I think most of us need to refocus on that. What do you say to those who are who are worried about about getting into this and how to explain why they charge premium pricing. You know, what's funny about that is they explain it all the time. Your sales team or you are consistently being asked if you've been in sales more than a day. So how did you arrive at that number? Why are you more expensive? And then we have to justify it. The sad thing is too often we're justifying well after we've lost a huge amount of people in the process, right? We know, based on all the studies, that over 70% of the buying decision is made before someone engages you, walks into your doors, talks to a salesperson. They're 70% home. It's during that 70% where they're vetting you to death, during that 70% where they want all the answers, during that 70% where they want to find out about budget, cost, and price. And if they can't find it from you, they are going to sure as heck leave. That is human psychology and buyer psychology in 2020 and beyond. And so the idea that anybody could be the exception, exception to this today is naive. The key is, well, how do you do it? Even a financial planner, right? You take that industry there, they could say, well, you know, I don't necessarily have direct costs. Yeah, but you get compensated. How do you get compensated? How does that compare to how the industry does it? What makes some financial planners expensive or more costly? to work with what makes them cheaper if 
you want to explain your value proposition, please, for all that's pure and holy, do it. But if you do not explain your value prop, you are unintentionally commoditizing your industry. And people complain about commoditizing. And they say, well, I don't want to give a price because that will commoditize what I sell. No, ignorance commoditizes stuff. Somebody doesn't know what defines value, then they choose the cheapest thing. That's commoditization. But if they do know and they choose the cheapest thing, it's just because they're making that choice. No different than the person that is getting the Mercedes, to your point, Nick, knows they're going to spend more. But they're doing it because they want a freaking Mercedes. Yep. That's how it works. And, and giving the customer, I see there's this old school phenomenon of like, we want to, and I don't think a lot of people subscribe to this, but a lot of our habits and tendencies are taught from people who have this bias of uh, the old school sales product of like talking someone into a corner to where they can't say no. Right. And this, we all, I mean, you know, we now based on this thing called the internet, we all know uh, that, you know, telemarketing, everyone sort of hates it. We all know that everyone hates high pressure sales. We all know that if you're sold something that's a bill of goods and it's not a good product, you're, you're going to be a ripoff report about it or whatever. And, and yeah, commoditization is super interesting. So my business is storytelling and it's so interesting because so many people say, Oh, well, I mean, I don't have a story. It's like, well, you then you're commoditizing yourself because literally the only thing someone cannot copy that you have, the only thing is your story. Like, bar none, they, they couldn't recreate what you've lived with. And how many times have we seen uh, great, the, great sales copy or great storytelling make something exponentially more valuable. I mean, the easy one would be, I'm actually on this, uh, on this email list because I uh, m made the mistake or had the good fortune, whichever way you want to uh, call it, of buying a cigar that was half smoked by Winston Churchill at an auction. <laughs> and uh, I ended up rehumidifying it, chopping it up, shredding it up, and selling the last 250 cigars on earth you can share with Winston Churchill. So it worked out because uh, we sold them for a thousand bucks a set. But it was just, a, a, but the this auction site has the best sales copy ever because they're like, you know, if I told you that you could have this pen for $10,000, you'd probably delete this email. But what if I told you this pen was the pen that signed the Declaration of Independence or it's like, oh, wait a second. Now the story makes this pen very different, right? And yep. so I, I hate when people cop out really and say, I don't have a story. It, and, and they also say, I don't know what I would talk about. And I'm like, well, you're clearly telling a story to your prospects every day. So if you're not making any sales, you probably don't have anything to talk about. However, if you are making sales, like we're just going to have the regular conversations and just tell me the story the way you would tell it to a prospect. Another thing I find interesting that you talk about in the book is that how much the line between sales and marketing has now blurred. It is no longer. Blurred, buddy, blurred. Yes. Yeah, so explain that and, and the hypothesis for that. Well, it goes back to that. A couple of different stats that are really significant. So mention one that on average, 70% of the buying decisions are made before they actually talk to a salesperson. They recently redid that study. Now it's 80% on average, and that was a B2B study. So that's a real, for a lot of people, that's a clear head slapper because what that basically means is marketing is handling 80% of the sales process because when they're vetting you online, that is the sales process. That's part of the sales process. So that's very significant. Another one that was just recently came out, Gartner came out with this like two weeks ago, Nick. It's a game changer uh, in many ways. And that is um, today, 33% of buyers say they would prefer to have a seller-free sales experience. So in other words, if they had a choice, I could or couldn't work with a salesperson on this particular purchase. 33% would say, I don't want to work with a salesperson. Now, for millennials, that number's 44%. Wow. Now, if anybody thinks that number's going down anytime soon, you're on crack. That number is only going up. And so you're saying, oh, wow, how do I create a seller-free sales experience? Well, you better be willing to give them more and to sell them differently. In other words, you must enable them to make buying decisions without forcing them to stinking call you or have a conversation with you. And the problem though, people say is, yeah, but that, that commoditizes Marcus or that dehumanizes or that takes away our advantage, which is our personal touch. Yeah. So the question is, can you create an incredible, amazing personal human touch 
with what you're doing on your website, with what you're doing with your video strategy? Of course the answer is yes. Yes, yes, you can. This is why there's many people out there, Nick, that you know you haven't met, but they feel like they know you because they listen to your stuff, they watch your stuff, and if they saw you on the street, they would talk to you like you've been friends for a long time. You wouldn't know them from Adam or Eve, but they know you, and that's that's where we are in 2020. That's absolutely true. I, I used to talk about this a ton about a decade ago, and I say, look, you know, um, everyone has a, a personal brand, whether you are tending to it or not. You do, but you know, there's this this concept of. Uh, Dunbar's rule, Dunbar's number, there's only a certain amount of relationships you can have in your life, and your brain starts to muddy the waters the further out it gets to this finite number. So, you know, if I have a relationship with my mom, my grandma, my wife, my kids, like, that's like in the first 10, 20. By the time you start getting, like, between 50 and closer to 100, like, if you watch Oprah every day, she's she's one of your friends. If you see the local personal injury lawyer on TV, like, I have literally, I, I, there's a guy who I, I was going to the gym. I saw this guy in in a mall back when you used to go to malls and I'm like oh hey and I realized like in a in a second like he looked back and he, he waved but like wait a second I've never spoken to this man in my life but I, I saw him in a different context he was a friendly face I'd waved to him at the gym before he was someone who I knew and you know if you ever it's sort of like you can be in the grocery store and you know pick up a can of corn you look up and there's that personal injury attorney that's on TV a hundred times a day you do feel like you know him you would call him by first name hey hey Jim hey hey Tawny whatever you would you would say it and so um that's uh, showing up regularly and consistently with personality mind you um with valuable content i'm actually working doing a ton of uh what i'm calling real-time storytelling for clients right now which is just new media marketing right we've created what i hope to someday be like the amazon web services of new media content production you want one podcast created you want a million created just put it in the system we have human beings who do it but i was working with a personal injury lawyer and he said hey nick I've been seeing your podcast. I'm like, awesome. So I don't know what that really means because have you watched any? Does Facebook just remind you? But the reason I do this on Facebook Live and we're starting to add it to LinkedIn and everything else is because they're so interested in getting viewers to watch live content that every time I go live, they notify everybody. So like instant like bookmark in someone's brain, oh, Nick's still alive. Like that's one. Number two is like, he's like, I've been, I've been checking out your podcast. It's really cool. So again, what does that mean? I could be arrogant and think, oh, He's been watching all my podcasts. He loves them. He's been reading all my He's am- He loves me. Or I could be like, okay, he noticed. And I just said to him, I said, hey, you know, um, thank you so much. I'm like, you know, you should be doing the same thing. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, look, you're a personal injury lawyer and you're great at it, but there's everyone in your community, because that's basically a community driven role. Like your, your marketplace might be a city or a town or it might be a state or it could be the country, but typically it's, you know, a pretty tight geographical boundary. I'm like, everyone around knows because they've seen your commercials and seen your, you are a personal injury lawyer, but there's only so many times people want to hear, have you been bitten by a dog? Have you been hit by a truck? Like whatever it is, like, what if we were to shift this and you were actually to provide value? to the people in your community. Like, for instance, there's plenty of fascinating chefs and business owners, and there's a mayor in your town. There's probably some people who've written books. There's people on specialized in parenting, people who specialize in probably infectious diseases, uh, sleep, like whatever it is, like doctors, like there's so many, like what if your community, because they know you're a lawyer, they just know. What if they were like, man, I love watching him every time he comes on live or I'll even go back and save and listen to a podcast to read a blog because I know they're actually going to give me value in my life and oh yeah if I ever get bitten by a dog or hit by a truck I will call but like I'm sick of being pounded in the face by this old style of marketing that as you bring up in the book is becoming less and less and less um, it, it penetrates way less because it's just noise at this point so the alternative is to provide valuable content you started it you brought up video which is a great media one of my favorites, of course, started it with blogging. One of my favorite stories uh, that I read from the book is you got asked a question that really no one wants to be asked, yet you chose to answer it, not only in person, but on the blog. Uh, and I, I believe the question was something like this, Marcus, it seems like you guys run a great pool company, but let's assume your pool company wasn't in business. Who are who are your top competitors in the area that if you weren't in business that you would recommend that I hire? I mean, mind-blowing question, by the way, a great question by a, a potential client, um, pretty ballsy question by a potential client, but you answered it. Talk about how you answered it and what that did for your business. Yeah, so, you know, 
two of the big five are reviews and best. People are always thinking about who's the best, such and such. You're always searching it. We're always looking for reviews of companies. Now, this also manifests itself when you're talking to customers. They'll say things like you just said, Nick. So, Marcus, and, and, the, and the story was I was in Richmond, Virginia. This was probably eight or nine years ago when I was winding down my career as a pool salesperson, right? And uh, and I still own this company, by the way, but, but I stopped selling pools uh, many years ago. And... I had met with this couple for about two and a half hours, and they said to me at the end, Marcus, we like you. We think we want to get this pool from you, but if we don't get this pool from you, is there anybody else you'd recommend? And I didn't sell the pool that night because they were still looking, right? But I had a long drive home, and I thought to myself, well, they asked the question, and I got the rule. The rule is, Marcus, they asked the question, you're going to answer it. So I went home that night, and I wrote an article, and it was, and the title is, Who are the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia, review slash ratings? And I came up with a list of five of the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia. What's really funny is I didn't even put myself on the list of five. And people still are like, dude, you didn't put yourself on the list? It's like, no, because if you create a list of you know the five most eligible bachelors you know, in New York City and you put yourself on the list, it's pretty self-serving, and it makes it look really, really cheesy, and plus, that's the antithesis of trust. And so it's obvious from the article that we're the experts because we're the one willing to address the question. I make it clear. We're a pool company. People ask us all the time, who are our biggest competitors in Richmond? And so if you're in Richmond and you're looking for other options, here's five companies that we constantly go up against that have a solid in-ground pool building history in, in, in Richmond, Virginia. Now, here's what's so fascinating about this story, Nick. Of course, if you go online today and you search best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia, it's one of the first pieces of content you're going to see. But here's where it gets really cool. Let's say you are online and you're researching one of my competitors like Playmore Pools um, and you search reviews Playmore Pools, Richmond, Virginia. Well, today, if you go online and you search that, we're one of the first ones you're going to see. And that's why I consistently get leads from people that were searching for reviews of our competitors. Because in my mind, if they're going to learn about my competitors, well, they might as well learn about them on my website, which sounds so crazy to some people. But um, it's, 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 you know, it's like, well, you get asked the question, so let's address it. And it was a total game changer for me. That single article that I said about, you know, Richmond uh, Pool Builders has done over a million dollars in revenue for the company that has produced. It's been cash cow. And I've, we've seen so many of those, yet there's still so many businesses that are afraid that by doing that, you've introduced them to the competition. And that's just saying buyers are dumb. This is not 1995 pre-internet, right? This is 2020, and consumer ignorance is no longer a viable sales and marketing strategy. And the moment we stop pretending that people are uninformed and start treating them as intelligent human beings, the amount that we can teach and therefore the trust that we can gain is exponential, Nick, and that's what's fun. Absolutely. It's the equivalent of uh, I, I think that everyone would admit at least that there are questions people have and there's we could probably name 10 questions that pretty much every business has. And then there and there's easier questions and there's hard questions. But just because they're hard questions doesn't mean they don't exist. And so I, I compare this to when people say, oh, man, I don't want to talk about that. I say, OK, so I just want to ask you, especially someone who has kids like I know you do, too. I'll say, OK, so um, I know my kids are interested in the birds and the bees. So would I rather them learn about it on the playground <laughs> from from a, a, another kid who is completely unqualified that I, I know because a kid on my playground tried to teach me in third grade and they had it all wrong. And so, like, would you rather them go get it there or would you rather them get it here? And so I, I, I made that comparison all the time. People laugh. The best analogies I've ever heard for this conversation, Nick. Would you mind if I use that at some point in a talk that I gave? No. Please. That is so good. I just love it. <laughs> it's, well, good. I'm glad you like it. Absolutely. Your, your book has been amazing for me, so uh, not a problem at all. I, I think one of the things that was interesting, you asked the question in the book about how many web pages do you think someone who, a prospect that comes to your website, is visiting before they bounce off? And 
everyone who I asked the question gives me about the same answer that you published in the book and that I thought of. I, I read, I listened to the audio book, by the way. I didn't read it. I have it up there, but I listened to it. Um, three, to, about three to five. I think that's what most people would say. I had a few people say 10, but that's like on the outside, three to five. When you were putting this much, well, you still have this much quality content on your website. Tell us about not only the average visitor, or whether you know that or not. Actually, it's the average buyer is probably more important. But tell us yeah. how much your mind was blown by what you learned about that. Yeah. So this story starts in 2013. I was looking at two different groups of people on my company's website. First group filled out a form, said, I want to get a quote, but didn't buy. Second group filled out a form, said, I want to get a quote, and they did buy. So I said, what fundamentally is the behavioral difference between these two people in terms of what they're looking at, how they're consuming content on the website? And the number 30 kept jumping out. And what we found was if somebody read 30 or more pages of the website before the initial sales appointment, they would buy 80% of the time. If they didn't hit that magical number, closing rates were about 25%, which is industry average. So literally, they go from 25 to 80% just by consuming 30 pieces of our content, articles, videos, etc. So I said, oh, gosh, look at this. This is huge. If we just find a way to get people to consume this much content every time, they're going to buy 80% of the time, right? And so at that point, it just became math. It was stop being sales. It became math, really. And so we became very intentional about the way that we had our prospects consume the content. We literally gave them an assignment before we would come out to the house, and we made it required that they read and watch these things, 30 pieces of our content. We had to set up in an organized way. And what happened is closing rates just skyrocketed. And we were able to go on less appointments. We met with way better people. And it was absolutely amazing. It's called assignment selling. I've now actually taught that to sales teams all over the world. What's interesting is your marketing department could produce a lot of good content. But oftentimes sales doesn't understand, for whatever reason, how to integrate that well into the sales process. So it's something that you need to teach them. But if you do this right, if you go to your sales team to help ideate the content you should be producing based on the questions they're hearing all the time okay plus what you're seeing and then you produce that content once again maybe with the help of the sales team because oftentimes they're the subject matter experts and then you produce that content and teach said sales team how to integrate this content into their sales process now all of a sudden we are cooking with gas man and it gets really really exciting and that's how you have what is known as a revenue team instead of sales on one side marketing on the other more and more companies when they're really progressive in terms of the way that they do business are we're seeing revenue teams and underneath the revenue team umbrella you have sales and you have marketing I love it. And all this, by the way, everyone, you can find in the book, the second edition of They Ask You Answer. Uh, pick it up. It will change the way you think about everything. We're, we're covering some awesome highlights here, but there's so much in that book that we obviously are not going to get to in just an, an hour conversation. You know, the the thing about the the selling in that way, shape or form, I mean, we've all had we've all had tire kickers, right? So that, you know, they're prospects and suspects, some people call them, right? And so a, <laughs> yeah. a, a good prospect is somebody who's genuinely engaged and interested in what you're offering. And a good, there's nothing better than a good prospect. Like I love a great prospect. Like we can have, we can have a couple conversations and we're there, like we, we're going to do business together. But the suspect is somebody who's like, maybe was referred in, they don't even know what you do, they, whatever. And, and our job is to, educate them so they not only make a good decision but they know if, if we might even be what they're looking for and I find it so interesting that salespeople have been I guess preconditioned to to think in, in a lot of ways that their time is not as valuable as the prospects and I hate that I hate that differential and only right. only when you're not providing value to someone on the other side of the, of, of the conversation is their time worth more than yours and so if you are here to literally serve them I decided to tell everyone start everything with serve them just serve them well and, and you'll you'll be shocked what happens first of all um, but when you serve them well um, things start to shift. So in order for me, if as a, as a sales professional, if I'm thinking, how might I serve this person well? Well, first of all, one of the things we don't want to do, first of all, I don't want to waste 
my time if I'm a sales professional. And I really don't intend to waste someone else's time because it's really just wasting my time, even if we're being selfish. They're just, that's just gonna waste my time too. So what if I were just to try to get them a few pieces of great content material prior to the meeting? And as you know, I learned this from you. Um, and hey, I, I would love to meet with you this Friday at two o'clock or whatever it is. Um, but in order to make sure that our meeting is fruitful, I've got a couple pieces of content here that a video is only three to five minutes and a couple short articles I would love for you to read. If you can't commit to reading them by this Friday, no problem. Let me know when you can and we'll reschedule for the time that you can. But by taking the time to not only do you show the prospect that you value your own time, uh, that you're you're not desperate, and there's so much psychology in all of that, but you really are giving them, I, I loved, and you said it well in the book, so I'll just repeat it. If someone's not willing to do that, it's very easy to say, hey, we've found that customers who aren't willing to be educated on our processes are not happy with our end result because they didn't really understand what we did, and maybe someone else would have given them what they wanted. So I'm really giving you this information to make sure that I'm a good fit for you, Assuming that I am, we'll crush it for you. But if we're not, I don't want to go down this road to where, you know, you're going to be unhappy, I'm going to be unhappy, and we're both going to be miserable. And most people have never heard that broken it's down that way. It's refreshing, man. It's refreshing. And they immediately say, dang, because there's a flinch there. Like, wow, I can't believe this person is being so honest with me. They do appreciate that. And you're not just, you know, doing the, the traditional schlep sales, like whatever it takes to your point. We're on equal grounds. You know, one thing I... I, I you know, I, I have to remind people often is the rights of the teacher are greater than he or she who does not teach. And so when, as a salesperson, you are providing definitive teaching value, content, text, video, etc., that's helping them make an informed decision, you have earned the right to ask them to do things your peers cannot ask them to do. So I can say to you, Nick, would you take the time to do these things before our appointment on Friday? Which could be audacious to say, hey, I need you to read these 30 pages of whatever I've produced, right? Yeah. That sounds audacious, but once you have taken the time to produce the thing, now you have earned that right. And what happens as a result of this is not only, of course, do they move themselves down the funnel because they're just learning more and it's coming from you. You have become the authority, and they're more invested in you. So the customer, the prospect, has sunk costs now in the relationship, and that's what's so fascinating about it. They have sunk more in the relationship with you, causing them to feel more invested in you at all. Uh, I love that. Another thing, just for those of you listening, another nugget of wisdom. If you listened in, we talked about it. I want to interview Chris Voss, you know, former lead FBI hostage negotiator, author of yeah. Never Split the Difference. One of my, one of the other most profound sales, um, respectful and mind blowing sales tactics that he shared is, um, you know, I went to law school and we, everyone was forced to read the book, getting to yes. And we've all seen in the sales process, like, you know, one of the things is get them to say yes, as many times as possible. That way they can't say no. Like, and everyone's now like preconditioned, like in sales. Oh, wait a second. Are they getting me to say yes? Are they getting me to say yes? Like, I, I don't want to say yes. And so he said, no, actually make people Maybe people understand that you value their time, you actually value them, and give them a no first. So the actual first question would be instead of like, I uh, would be, hey, is now a bad time? Uh, and they'll be like, uh, and they'll say, oh no no no, this is a perfect time. So so you, sorry, you allow them to say no. You give them you give them boundaries with them to say no, so they can understand. Oh, I'm in control of this conversation. I'm not going to be led in a in a manner that's going to make me feel out of control, and I'm going to do something I didn't even want to do to begin with because I've been woven into a web. That was another really simple, articulate, easy way to build trust in a way that's actually has integrity. I mean, imagine that uh, selling with integrity. That, that's crazy stuff right there. Groundbreaking. <laughs> it, it is. Um, one of the things I think is really cool about your your best in class strategy, you talk in, in sort of these big five. Um, most people are uh, at level one, they're they're. They work in their business. We've all been there, right? So you're building a business. You are working in that business. You're doing everything, or you know, you're you're you can hardly hold the wheels on because you're trying to produce. Then at some point, if you're lucky, at least some of your time, if not all of your time, becomes working on your business, and you have other people working in your business. Um, you didn't articulate this way, but your best in class to me is sort of a third level 
of that. And, and it's not just that I'm in my business, I'm in this business. And if I choose to rise up a level and talk about my industry and to share best practices and things that are working for me and things like um, it builds you to a whole, you can become the go-to person in the industry. I mean, your example, you didn't write this book for pool salespeople, but by the way, you built an entire career, an agency, just by looking at your business and your industry from, you know, from a 30,000 foot view instead of being on the ground. I, I think that's something most people, it's a chasm most people think is much larger than it is. Um, if you look in your own industry, there's probably maybe a handful of people, and particularly the deeper you dig down into a niche, um, the, there's maybe a handful of people who are actually providing really good, unbiased information to the industry. And so just tell me a bit about, I don't know, your thoughts, philosophy on, on best in class and, and, and what you recommend for people to do. Oh, well, you know, I mean, so much to say about this. Uh, you know, as buyers, we're obsessed with best, with ranking systems. We want to be able to see, you know, who's in the middle, who's in the top, who's at the bottom. We don't necessarily always want to buy the very best. We just at least want to know, though, because that helps us gauge where we want to fall when we make this decision. Now, if you think about that and you said, okay, well, how many best-based questions are we getting all the time? And there's just so many that we're getting. And when you do this, although it's gutsy, it turns you, to your point, into not only the voice of trust, Nick, but a power broker in your space. So let me give you, uh, let me give an example uh, to listeners. So it was probably around 2010 or 11. I was saying to myself, you know, I'm selling fiberglass pools. It's kind of like selling cars because how it is is there's manufacturers. There's probably a dozen major manufacturers of fiberglass pools at the time. There was a dozen manu manufacturers of cars. And I was like a Ford dealer, essentially, to for a fiberglass pool company. Okay, I was like a dealer. And so I said, you know, I read these best-in-class car magazines. People love that stuff. They eat it up. They want to know best sports car, blah, blah, blah. So I said, why don't I do that for pools? Why don't I create a best-in-class for swimming pool shapes and sizes? So I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. And I said, you know, I said, best fiberglass pool design awards for 2012. And I gave a, uh, essentially I gave awards to the different mm. – manufacturers who I was selling against in my space. So essentially, to make the comparison, I was the Ford dealer saying best sports car goes to the Chevy Camaro. You know, best family sedan goes to the, except I was saying best kidney shaped pool, best rectangle pool, best deep end pool, right? All these things. And I was giving these awards to different manufacturers. And of course, it just got read like wildfire. And what's so funny is I started having manufacturers contact me and I was getting different responses. Some of them were saying, who, who, who gave you the right to say this, right? You're just this at the time. I was like, you know, I was, you know, probably around 30, 32, 33 years old. Who gave this snot nosed kid doing this stuff online? Who gives him the right to do this? And of course, whenever they would ask me, I would say, well, the internet gave me the right to do it. <laughs> and then the, the, the thing, the other side of it though, is I was literally having manufacturers saying, Hey Marcus, I noticed we weren't on your award list. How about we fly you out to our manufacturing facility so you can see what we have to offer the marketplace? So I, I realized, wow, I am now the power broker in this industry. And I became such a strong influence that it was dictating uh, like these major manufacturing brands all over all over the North America. That's one of the reasons why I started a manufacturing company. Because I had way more influence as this little Ford dealer. So think, of, imagine a Ford dealer invents their own car line and quickly becomes bigger than Ford. That's what happened with us. We became a major manufacturer, became the fastest growing manufacturer in the country. And it's all because of this mindset that we're talking about here of they ask, you answer, become the voice of trust, be the Wikipedia of your industry, your niche. So I love that. The one thing that I think a lot of people are going to have a bit of cognitive dissonance with is so you're you're giving awards to people you're selling against and you're obviously not naming yourself because that would be self-serving. So that that's so hard to cross. So let me give you an cross. example. In that case, in that case, because it was a manufacturer, I was carrying a manufacturer at the time. 
and remember I was a Ford dealer, let's say carrying Ford. Yep. And then I was, I, there was all these that we were competing against, all these other pool manufacturers. So I would give Ford certain awards. Okay. I, if I felt like they merited it. Yeah. Okay. Now, if it's an article specifically about myself, right? Who's the best pool builder in Virginia? Okay. At that point, I'm not going to do it. Now, you can still do it if you want to. First of all, you could do it if you wanted to anyway, but it comes across as self-serving. So another way to do this, if you want to talk about yourself, is you source third-party references, right? And so if you've been in publications or industry whatevers and you've received certain awards or there's been certain studies in your industry done, right, then you can really – that is a good opportunity to brag about yourself because now you have social proof behind it. So as long as you do it in a kosher way, it's really, really strong. But the name of the game, Nick, is to own the conversation. That's all I really care about. If you're going to learn it, if you're going to ask it, if you're going to talk about it, I want to be a part of that conversation right stinking there. And if I can get you in my house, in my living room, a.k.a. my website, then eventually there's a very good chance we're going to become friends and you're going to want to buy. That's how you get a million visitors a month to an unsexy industry which is swimming pools. Although during COVID, it's pretty sexy to have a pool. <laughs> yeah, it is. I would also say that, look, uh, content would trump just about all this, but I do think uh, when we are in a, a world even prior and post uh, COVID where people are going online looking for everything. Uh, be mindful that your online living room, online office doesn't look like a crack den. Like let's, let's, let's clean it up a little bit so that, you know, people know you actually uh, respect yourself and take showers and things like that. Um, yep. You know, you also, you mentioned, uh, I think owning the conversation is uh, if you take nothing else away from this and, and you, you don't remember what to do, like tactically there are things you, there are tactics, but strategically the only thing you need to remember is, Anything I do, is this adding to me owning the conversation or subtracting? I think that's a, a great sort of line to draw on the sand. Um, in, in that vein, uh, you talk also about uh, video and doing a lot of video in-house in, in, your, uh, in your book. Uh, one thing that you say that I have – I keep trying to find the right way to articulate it, and it's, in, it's a little clumsy when I say it. Um, I'm making a bigger – I'm trying to make it a bigger point than you just – you don't gloss over. You just say it very simply, and maybe I just need to do that. But you say every company is a media company. I say if you don't have a, at least a division of your company that is your, that is a media division, you'll be out of business for the next five to ten years. I mean because we are in the business of – of using media to grow our businesses. And that is becoming more and more evident every day. I mean, there's different types of media. Media is just a medium for sharing your story. I'm known for saying your brand is just your story. Branding is simply storytelling. And a great brand is a story that other people want to share for you. These media formats are just mediums for sharing that story. And now we have a plethora of options, a cornucopious as we're around uh, Thanksgiving, we'll use that word, a cornucopia of options on how to do that. Uh, Video is a great one. Uh, tell me a little bit about how every company is a media company and then share what some of your best practices are for video. Well, you know, um, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this subject. When I say everybody is a media company, whether they like it or not, this is purely just based on consumption online. Um, we know that 85% of the content consumed online is video-based. We know that as a fact. And based on that, it's one of these undeniable waves that has hit all of us. Some of us didn't see it coming. Um, for others, it was quite obvious if we just look at our own behavior or, you know, teenagers' behaviors, you know, et cetera. The thing about saying that you're a media company, I say that because you have to make a shift as a business in terms of the way you think. So in other words, I've got multiple organizations, but I'm a media company that happens to sell pools. I'm a media company that happens to manufacture pools. I'm a media company that happens to have... Um, a digital sales and marketing agency. My media company happens to speak. But notice media company comes first because that's how we're going to be successful in showing the thing. right? So we take it very seriously. Every one of my companies has a full-time videographer that works for it, which is pretty stunning if you consider my speaking company has three employees, okay? Because I'm the only, like, I'm the breadwinner of that company. I speak, people get paid. One of those people is a full-time videographer, you say, wow. And I don't know how many speakers have a full-time videographer, but guess who never lacks for video? This guy right here. 
And you don't need a videographer to do that. But the point is, that's how serious I am about it. As you know, you cannot be passive about this thing. It's crazy to me when I see large organizations, even small to medium sized business, but large organizations, serious brands, they don't even have one in-house videographer. Are you freaking kidding me? It is 2020, right? And so, you know, with my pool company, if I wanted to, I could keep two to three videographers full-time, busy, 50 hours a week busy. So when anybody says to me, I, to your point, Nick, like everybody's got a story. And if you can't see that story, you're just, you're, you're really underselling yourself, right? And your value to the marketplace. Everybody's got something to show. And if we can tell it, we sure as heck can show it. Now, the thing about video is a lot of companies feel like video is just almost like this impossible thing. It's unattainable. You have to hire an outsourced agency to do it for you. And that is just not freaking true. And I'm not saying that you can't have some of it outsourced, but the future of content production online is not having to always have to call somebody to do it for you. It's the ability to do some of these things in house, produce your own articles, produce your own videos, at least 80% of them is what I say. And so the other side to this is if you look at how video is so important, how much video is needed to go big, right? Because we have found, because we've got the data that when a company produces a hundred educational videos a year or more, they experience hockey stick like growth just in terms of the impact videos having on their digital sales and marketing. Well, go outsource a hundred videos to a video production company versus hiring somebody for $60,000 a year. And you let me know how, how each one goes. Cause I've tested them both. And I'm telling you right now that you're not going to get an outsourced video production company to come in and train your people how to be better on video and work with them and practice with them and really help them get great. It ain't going to happen unless you're doing it in-house. Yeah. And so that's where we got to go. I, I love that. Give people an idea. Obviously, I mean, the, the real secret is probably answering any question that is coming up that you can possibly imagine or a customer ever asks. Most people would say, I have no idea how you could, number one, keep three videographers. I'm sure they're editing too busy for 50 hours a week. Or how could I possibly – how could there possibly even be 100 things to talk about in my industry? Like wh where do they begin? Well, it, you know, I've never seen an industry – that didn't consist of hundreds of questions from buyers, unique questions. I've just never seen it. Maybe it exists. Maybe if you sell bubble gum, I don't know. But I've just never seen that industry before, at least in the ones that I've worked with. And I've worked with so many, plus so many people have read the book now. It's like the amount of case studies. I'm like, wow. And they're like, yeah, Marcus, you know, they're selling like, you know, 10 cans and they've got like hundreds of questions they brainstorm because they really, really listen to the buyer to the marketplace and your point is right nick that's where you start you know one of the videos that we talk about and they ask you answer it's most effective because video really should start with your sales team it shouldn't be a marketing first initiative it's a sales first initiative because if it's sales first that means you're going to directly attribute revenue to it much faster which gives you more approvals from your cfo more resources more budget to build that department out so you start with sales always whether it's with your textual content with your video based content and one of the most successful videos we've seen is what we call 80% video. And 80% video is derived from this. If you go to any sales team and you say, what percentage of the questions you get from a prospect are essentially the same questions every single time you have a first appointment, assuming it's the same product or service. Um, they'll say it's 80%. Like the number is roughly 80% of the time. And so if that's the case, why do we keep answering the same dang questions over and over again? It doesn't make really much sense at all. It's like Groundhog, every sales appointment is Groundhog's Day, Groundhog's Day, Groundhog's Day. So what if they already knew the answer to those 80% and they had heard it from you? How would the sales appointment change? Right? Closing rates would go up. The time spent on the sales appointment would probably go down. And you spend way more time selling, less time teaching. This is the goal for every salesperson. So we call that the 80% video. So you want to choose the top 7 to 10 questions you know you're going to get every single time and produce a video that yes, it's not gonna be a short video that addresses those seven to 10 questions well. And last thing I'll say about that, people say, yeah, but I heard, Marcus, that video should be less than 90 seconds. 
maybe the stupidest stat in the history of the internet because that's really based on Facebook videos. And if you go to YouTube, YouTube is long form video. Facebook is short form video. And if we use that logic, we'd say all videos should be less than seven second, seconds because that's the big drop off is after seven seconds. So you don't want everybody to watch all your videos. In fact, you don't want everybody to get to the end of your videos because there's a certain percentage of people that are going to say, huh, oh, it's not a good fit. Now I know this isn't this isn't right for me. Now I know that's a win. That's also a victory. And so what we want to do is produce content that buyers will appreciate and say, yes, this helps me to buy or not to buy. And the idea that they won't spend the time is naive, assuming that it's valuable. Our average customer has watched well over 30 minutes of our videos, well over 30 minutes of our videos. So the idea that they don't is just bad, bad advice online. I love it. Yeah, I'll go with a, an old, uh, another Dan Kennedy saying from sales letters, and it applies to video said all the time. It can never be too long just too boring and you know so what does it take to Great. make sure it's not Great. too boring right so you have to educate me most people say oh people won't watch that but i would just challenge you i know i do it and i know a lot of other people do it so i think most consumers would if you're like if you ordered the new ford bronco right now right let's just say because you can't even get it yet like oh i ordered the tesla truck right can't even get it yet but everything that comes out everything i can find on it because i can't even get my hands on it yet i'm watching the videos i'm reading the articles i'm like oh this like you know and it's something I'm interested in. If it's something you are interested in, you're going to take the time. You're going to read. You're going to read the articles. Yeah. You're going to watch the videos. If they're not interested, that means they're literally disinterested. That's not the person that you want to speak with. So why waste right. the time? Um, right, Marcus. Amazing stuff. Uh, they ask you answer. Everyone should go buy it. Eight copies. Friends, family, c uh, company, everyone else. Uh, where where else should they go to learn more about you and follow up with you, uh, Marcus? Yeah, well, you can you can email me directly if you have questions. Marcus at MarcusSheridan.com. Um, but, frankly, my place where I live is LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find my best stuff there. I have a newsletter there, and I'm very active on LinkedIn. And plus, LinkedIn is a place of positive people, and you don't have all the Discord, so I'd highly recommend you connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, thanks for all the great info, and uh, we'll see you next time. My pleasure, buddy. All right, take care, everyone. We'll see you next time on Now to Next. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.